Okay. Test. Test one. Are we live? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose so. Not sure. How do I know? I think yes. Well, it says live, yeah. so I guess we are. Yeah, yeah. So I guess we're just going to start it. Yeah. Um, so thanks for joining us today, guys. Um, I'm Francisco. I'm here uh, with the uh, Deep Learning Sessions Portugal and do you need Kolkine? I don't know if yeah. that's the... Kolkin. Yeah, that's almost there. Kolkin. Okay, okay. Um, and we are here to present you with um, a live stream about uh, deep learning um, AI with sports. So uh, we are Deep Learning Sessions Portugal. And we are a group of volunteers dedicated to chair insights on deep learning inside and outside of Portugal. Um, this is the second uh, one on one uh, talks that we have. Uh, this one is about sports. The previous one was about speech. If you want to see, you can check it out on our YouTube channel. And basically, it's going to consist of 45 minutes of a talk and then 10 to 15 minutes of QA uh, where you can ask your questions in the chat. Um, so uh, basically, uh, Leonid is a um, PhD student uh, at ID Lab and is working with um, AI with sports. Uh, he is the one who can talk about what he's doing because he's the one, yeah, mm -hmm. specialist in the area. Uh, and so I'm gonna just kind of give you the word, Leonid, and just get just get get, get started. <laughs> Sorry. All right. <laughs> and yeah. That's it. Right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much also for having me. Uh, it's great to to talk a little bit more to the Portuguese audience as well. Um, yeah, my name is Leonid. So yeah, even though I have this foreign name, but originally I've lived in Portugal before I moved for a PhD in Antwerp actually for quite some years and also studied there at the University of Porto. Um, yeah, as 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 you said, well, I'm doing my PhD connected to AI to sports. Some projects are related to sports, some not, but mostly are. Um, and this gave me a little bit also of room to explore to see what is out there, what is not out there. And this is where I base my presentation on. So the idea of this presentation, it's that it won't be super technical, but rather that I would give you an overview of all the possibilities that I think that there are with deep learning in sports, and then by giving some practical examples, either from our work that we do at our lab or from work outside to kind of paint the big picture. Um, and if we dive right into it, uh, if I look a little bit, uh, maybe, I don't know, I think my screen is not shared. Maybe if you could just- No, I can, I can, yeah. Bring up, yeah, perfect. Yeah. So um, if, if we talk a little bit about sports and, and data in sports, uh, we can say that basically there is a jungle of data. So if we're, for example, at a, at a stadium, um, there's plenty of places where the data actually might be collected. Uh, we can start from cameras that are probably placed somewhere in the, in the stadium to collect optical tracking data to see who's doing what at what time. Um, there is probably also, the players are probably also wearing sensors, heart rate sensors, but also positional sensors. And you might also have other type of sensors all around. So this is an example of a sensor that you can place, for example, on a bath, which measures the swings. So, and when you talk about, of course, baseball, you can, this can, I think this example can be applied nowadays to mostly any sports out there that it's so easy to get sensors. It's so easy to put some cameras on, on your stadium that you can get really a lot of data that it's sometimes really hard to actually sift through it. Um, so today, what I want to do in this presentation is try to show you a little bit what kind of data is out there in sports, and then maybe some applications and methods used in sports. Not everything is going to be about deep learning, but I think it's going to give you a bit of a broad picture of what can be done though with the data. Um, I'll also give some example of some commercial solutions that are actually already there. And then uh, finally, we can think a little bit about um, the future also, what could be done or what can we see AI and deep learning and machine learning, what all this can come down to. 
like I said before, this talk will not be too technical. So, but if you want to have a bit more technical discussions, of course, feel free to reach out. But my idea here was again to give rather a broader overview of what can be done, because I think more the technical details, it's also quite easy to research them and find them, of course. Um, so, yeah, data in sports can, of course, um, I think the most important thing, and this is where we use data in in many many aspects is that it can help us make better decisions so for example it's either to decide which athletes do we want to hire uh which or for how to automatically officiate certain games um check whether an athlete is prone to injury if he continues to exercise doing what he's doing uh, what is the best strategy to choose against a team or maybe even just to create help create a personalized training plan. And besides all the decisions, it can also help us with a little bit of fan engagement. Uh, more specifically, on one hand, making some things a little bit more automatic. So, for example, you could use LLMs. Now it's huge. the word LLMs is huge. So you can use that to make game summaries. And that can be done automatically. And on the other hand, also create more personalized and tailored content to the person who's watching. And this, I will show you, we'll talk about a little bit in a bit, but this can also create some opportunities for smaller sports sometimes that don't get a chance of the big broadcasting budgets that we have. Um, so if, for, if we look, if we look now at the type of data, and let's start there, that typically you can find um, in sports, well, um, first, there is sensor data, which normally it's, will be translated as a time series data that is recording during a game of workouts. Uh, what everyone will probably think about when we talk about um, the time series data is uh, heart rates. I think almost everyone have these smart watches now, nowadays, which measure the, the heart rates. Uh, but there is also more to it as well. So, for example, in swimming, there are some sensors you can wear on your hands that they detect basically the strokes that you do and how fast you do the strokes and if you're doing them correctly. Uh, for bikes, you have power meters, so they really measure how much force you're exerting on the pedal, and that's a really objective measure also of your uh, of the effort that you're doing. There's also new types of sensors that are being developed to measure sweat and so on. So there's a lot of time series data that is possible to analyze and use to create different kind of algorithms as well. Also, there are some time series, so we now talk a little about inactivity, but there's also off activity. So for example, you could track your sleep, which can, of course, as everyone knows, can affect how you perform in sports. Besides this, you also have spatial temporal data. So this one is normally analyzed within the context of team sports, but not only. Uh, with this, also comes event data. So basically you have the positional data within time, but then you, besides this from those, you can get events. And an event is basically, uh, it occurs somewhere on the field, and then it could be, for example, a pass, a foul, a goal, and usually has a time step associated with it, but also location and who the person was who did it. Also open data, or maybe even tabular data is the best classification for open data. Um, not always, but yeah, let's call it this way. We can you know, basically mine a lot of different results and game statistics for insight also online. And finally, I mean, video, uh, video data is the most I think obvious one. Uh, there's a lot of cameras, there's broadcasting. Um, it, you can just bring a camcorder with you to the stadium as well. That's another kind of data we can use to get some insights and get, and get some interesting information from. So from now on, how I structured the next part of the presentation is that I will talk a little bit about each type of data and how it can be used and why is it important. And then yeah, we'll take it also from there. So let's start with video data. So um, yeah, for video data, one cool thing that we can do with video data is actually pose estimation. Quite some time ago, if you wanted to analyze a pose or if you wanted to yeah, draw the pose of a human or to a computer, we would place some kind of markers. And then with the cameras, we would find these markers with very um, old type of algorithms. But nowadays, we have all these deep learning algorithms that can do, do this easily for us. And in this, as you can see here, also quite quickly. Um, this is actually an example of one really cool algorithm that does this with a very low latency. But if I also brought another example, which is called open pose, just to give you a little bit of an idea of how such an algorithm works. Again, I won't go too much into details, but basically they're based on any type of your computer, um, computer vision algorithm with some things on top. So first you just use a very, a very large 
um, network to get some to get to generate some features taking an input so that's going to be somewhere here maybe I can do it like this with a, with a laser pointer oh yeah perfect so you have some you get some feature sets from the image here and then basically what you have is two um, CNNs which basically basically multi-stage and one of them is something that is called the path which is the part affinity fields basically it encodes the degree of association between different body parts and then you can have some kind of confidence that a specific pair of body parts belong to the same person then they can form a limb and when i talk about a limb is that if you have one body part here is your hand another body part here is your elbow then this is, would be the limb so to say not everything is a limb but let's just call it this way um and then you also have something called confidence map stage it's um uh, yeah, this is basically will encode the belief uh, that the relevant body part is in each location of the image. So basically, it will try to find find it, as you can see here. And then what you do is basically with some math and some calculations, what you try to do is find bipartite matching between two limbs. So which which of these parts are connected with a limb, and then you put it all together. Of course, it's not as simple as I said right now. But the main idea behind it, it's not, it's that it's um, it's quite an interesting advanced algorithm, and there's really a lot of cool things you can do with it. One thing that we are trying to do, and I will say for now, this is still a work in progress, but we're working with a, with a volleyball team um, and trying yeah trying to basically create kind of a coach for uh, yeah uh, e coach or a coach assistant where you could upload a, v a reference video of a certain move being done correctly. And then you can upload your own video and try to compare to see if you're doing it right or wrong. And now, for example, where you see these red parts is where there is less similarity with the reference video, for example. This is still a little bit work in progress and there's a lot of things done. That's why I still cannot yet, yet go into details. But that's one cool example of something you can do with pose estimation. Um, so. Besides this, another thing you can do with video, of course, is um, tracking players on a field. Um, so there are some very advanced commercial methods based on multiple cameras and very advanced algorithms. We tried to do something a little bit low cost within our lab. Um, so basically this was for a project where we worked uh, with the National Belgium women's hockey team. And what, the goal here was to try to detect the players in the pitch with a very low cost setup. So this is just one um, GoPro camera that's stationed on one side of the fields. And um, what we wanted to get is just a JSON with the players detected at what time, and then also a virtual field of the image, as you can see here above, the, basically their position gets translated uh, to the, yeah, to the coordinates of where they are. As you can see, it's also not perfect, and we'll go in a little bit of details why it's not perfect, but I guess you can already guess and you can already see that sometimes there is occlusion and then it becomes a little bit hard to track them. Um, now, again, if you look at this, creating this technology is more on actually thinking how can we apply the current state of the art and put everything kind of together. So there's a lot of different models, different things, different methodologies that you use from different uh, works by, by different people. And um, yeah, this figure just kind of shows how our algorithm works. Again, this is also published. So if you're curious about this, you can, of course, read it in more details. And in, in this, this is the name of the paper itself. Um, but in a, in a gist, what we do, it's basically that in, we, in the, we use kind of the first frame to to do image segmentation. So the, we come we come from the uh, supposition that the camera will stay always in one place. So we can get the homography matrix in just from one stationary from a couple of stationary frames. And we run this on startup. And then we have different workers that try to detect the people, but also do a field detection to figure out so that where when the player is within the field or not. Because if we have audience, for example, we don't want to detect them as players. Um, there's a team labeling as well, uh, algorithm, and all this gets together. We do the projection of the location based on the image and the homography into a virtual field. And then we apply some extra filtering because if yeah, if you see the, the work with all these filters, the players are just kind of jumping around. Um, 
merge everything together, and then we get the outputs. As I said, so the results were quite also quite, I think they look quite nice. Um, we basically measured the results for the player detection, the field detection, the team labeling, and the system accuracy. So the whole system accuracy was around 93.8%. This was the help of also different filters, again, that we used. Uh, where we saw it does fail, so one thing is occlusion. So sometimes players, yeah, if one player is in front of the other, then it would get occluded. Sometimes there's a duplication of players, and sometimes it's also hard to recognize, recognize players. And I think this is mostly due to the fact, again, that we did this with one camera uh, pointing into one direction. And if you, yeah, if you go to the as far as this part of the field, I mean, even for myself, if I look, for example, at this person, even though it's not in the field, it's a little bit hard to tell if this is a person or some kind of box or something else. So I think for the computer algorithm, it's also going to be the same. Um, so, OK, so we have the video. We took a lot of tracking data from them, or maybe we have some GPS sensor. And now we have this kind of special temporal time series. And what could we do from there? Well, one thing that we can do, and I will jump this in a little bit in, in a little bit, but one thing you can do is then use have an algorithm that based on the tracking also labels events. Uh, you can also perhaps use it for automatic uh, refereeing or maybe for uh, do, for doing a tactical analysis as well. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe just give one example of a really interesting work I found, which is related to tactical analysis that can be done, and also again with deep learning algorithms. So there is something called ghosting, where basically you try to create a ghost of kind of a what if scenario. So if we take all the data of all your team and we look at the what would have your team done on average uh, in this kind of situation, we can kind of then create a ghost. So what this work does here, they, they basically just, they basically use two LSTM models. So one kind of the first phase where they model the average behavior of each player just in the defending team and it's very individual and then they take, the, they take that uh, model, so it's, they take that model, that pre-trained model, and they use it then to scale up to the training of a single player, to join training of multiple player, players to model kind of this collaborative multi-agent learning. Um, there's some, yeah, if you again, if you want to go deeper in this, I'll leave some links here and also some videos. There is also this paper, the presentation of this paper, which goes more into detail if you really want to look at it. I think uh, it, it's really interesting work. Um, but just to give you more of a sense of what is done then. So this was one, this was one uh, actual game situation. So you have one team in blue, another one team in red. And then you can also have, you have in the situation some kind of, and this is the ball if you can leave. And then you have some kind of uh, goal probability for that sequence. But then what you can actually do, you can create these kind of ghosts for the league itself. Uh, and then these white, um, Kind of yeah balls which are simulated players is kind of what would have an average the league would have done in this situation and then you can see there's a higher goal probability but then oh, what of your team would have done in this situation so it's um yeah then you can run kind of this simulation and try to understand if you've done the best that you've done what could you've done differently and i think this already from the tactical strategical point of view is already quite interesting on its own as well um so that's for tracking data. But then, as I said before, you can kind of uh, use this tracking data to either have a, some model which gives you events that happen or what also happens a lot of time. And this is, I think, the cool thing about sports is that there's actually a lot of labeled data, just that sometimes it sits somewhere uh, in a closed place. So especially if we talk about popular sports what will happen is that many teams will have this video analyst that label the game of different actions uh, that happened and who did what where basically so this is what i'm showing now is just a screen of one labeling application uh or software and it, what it what you basically do is label events that's yeah, you can actually kind of see them here you label the start and then of the event but then you can label who did it if it was from your team from the from the opposing team uh in which location more or less it happened so you get this really rich data set where you can get a lot of things out of it so you can already see the potential 
uh, there is from here. And this is the kind of data that if you have your tracking data, you could use to train to detect events, but also you could use to do some other cool things. Um, again, maybe one um, thing that's one interesting work, this was done by the team of Jesse Davis um, and uh, from the University of Leuven. And there is one paper that they, pub that they published actually speak louder than goals, valuing players' actions in sport in soccer. Um, and basically, the main thing is that, yeah, uh, how do you evaluate players, right? Normally, you can think in terms of, of course, number of goals, number of assists, but sometimes this does not really paint the whole picture of how much value or how much uh, more does that player bring to the team. This is this is where, when they wrote this paper, this is where they, the assumption they started from. So basically, uh, if you think about it, all actions or anything that you do in football basically have the goal to either score a goal or defend from a goal. I think that's quite uh, that is that is quite simple. So basically, then each action can have a positive or negative effect uh, on either these two um, on either these two goals that you want to do. So so and this means that probably we can actually think about how to quantify that. So let's say that there is a state, let's call it yeah, state SI, and then there is a previous state, SI minus one. Um, and then at each of these states, there's a probability to score. And each action can correspond, and each action, let's call it AI, can correspond to a change in this probability, right? So then we kind of get, or some of you might already understand where we're going with this, but then you can, can kind of this delta. Uh, you can also have the same thing for conceding a goal. So you can put all of this together. Uh, if you have this change for a certain action uh, to score, a change for a change in probability for this action to concede a goal, uh, you put them together, of course, with a minus because one is conceded, the other one is scoring, and then you would get a certain value for an action. So. And this, if you take this really rich event with all with really rich data sets of all these events, then you could probably uh, do a probabilistic classifier. And here you can use anything you'd like, actually boost neural network. In this case, if I remember correctly, I think they used cat boost, but yeah, any algorithm that gives you a probability, of course, can be used for this approach. Um, and then if you run then a game for this algorithm, you do get some kind of value for a player. <clears throat> so just maybe before I go to the result, that the results that, that, that they got, um, I think an important thing to mention is when I talk about this event data is what kind of data to actually feed to this algorithm. So it's when the action starts and finishes, the location on the field where it starts and finishes, uh, the player who did it, the teams, the player's teams, the action type, uh, exciting passing, shotting, dribble, body part that was used, and then also the result of the action, if it was successful or a failure. Um, and this is the kind of, uh, let's say, this is the kind of outputs you can get action per action, so you, and you get this kind of value. So, the, so this is one example of one, uh, yeah, the attack leading up to Barcelona's final goal in the 3-0 against Real Madrid in 2017. You can see that these values kind of change, uh, and there is some kind of value given to a certain action. And of course, the shot, which was scored the goal, of course, it has the biggest value, but all of them kind of contributed, right, to, to the ball getting there. And it's not just that one assist or that one, um, or that one uh, pass. So if you also look, um, if, we, if we take this rating, so there is then, uh, if you, again, if you're interested in this, I really invite you to read their paper, it's great. But if, um, if you look at the rating, then this is basically how, if they use the rating on their own, um, on their own um, value that they that they're proposing. So this is R V A E P. But then this is would be the rating of the player if it's by the number of goals, by the number of assists, goals and assists, and then their market value. Then I think that what already pops out here is that yeah, for example, Coutinho he was even though he was tenth on the number of goals second on assists or four from goals and assists but he's he's still probably according to this algorithm the most uh valuable player that was in this list so 
it's I think it's an interesting approach of thinking how could you use deep learning to then just calculate certain values for for a player. Um, so, all right, so another thing, of course, you can mine and look for, um, it's of course uh, results and open data. So there's plenty of open data there as well. There's, I mean, basically any results from any game sort of open and there's a lot of work done there as well. Um, we also did our own, uh, at the lab where I work at, we also did our own uh, prediction algorithm, but in this case, it was uh, a cycling uh, for cycling road cycling races um again this paper is also published so if you're interested in going to details you feel free to 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 look for it if you need the link just let ping me i can definitely share with a few um so in this case there's also a ton a ton a ton of papers that try to predict um different sports outcome so mostly it's in team sports football and bl and ba nhl etc that's just because it's the easiest one to do because then you just treat it kind of as a classification problem, win, lose, or draw. Um, and then there's really a big range of, of techniques that are used from probabilistic models to deep learning. So you can find all kinds of things. Um, and the, the, the easy thing about it is also external condition are similar in each game. So each game will happen in the same field. It will happen uh, with the same set of rules and nothing that much will change. Um, but what we had, if we think about cycling, uh, well, it becomes a little bit more difficult to kind of take the same approaches and trans and use them on on the on our use case because it's a then multi-contender sport. So it becomes a lot, um, many more people are racing or trying to win the same um, the same thing, but on the other hand, they're also racing teams. Uh, conditions can change heavily, so it's if someone wins race A, it doesn't mean he will be good at race B. Um, there's also a lot of unpredictable events, and then it's yeah, what I call strategical endurance sport because riders will not go faster than they need to, and not all riders are riding to win, but rather, sometimes rather just to support their team. So there's a lot more variables and making it a little bit more difficult as well. Um, so yeah if if we look at the at the state of the art um there are basically many of these classification model when we're talking about one versus one there's some regression models for multi contender sport but none of them optimizes for a ranking which at the end is the result of a, of a cycling race that you just get kind of a ranking right um so our question or research questions that can we use a uh, learn to rank approach to predict the top 10 uh, the top 10 racers or who will finish in the top 10 um, positions of a cycling race and why learn to rank well if if you think a little bit about there is some similarities we wanted with what we want to do so um, a learn to rank approach what you would typically have and this is very generalized of course is that you would you would use it normally for retrieving some kind of documents when, for example, you're searching uh, for something. So you would have some kind of query, and then you would have, so this is your ground truth, your data set. You have, for some kind of query, you would have some kind of document or some kind of whatever um, thing that you want to retrieve. And then you would have a weight, which is the relevance uh, of this document to this query. And then you have these kind of sets, you train a model with that, and then based on a new query, uh, you would get a list of rank and some number of documents you would get a list of ranked documents within what you wanted to do but we thought about it and probably this is what actually approximates the most out of algorithms that are out there to what we want to do so our sets are actually the past editions of a race for documents it's actually the the, the writer itself we don't use the query, so this is going to be a problem we'll see in a little bit. And then we just use weights where uh, we just decrement. So let's say we have, remember correctly, if those were the exact weights that we gave, because I remember we played around a bit with them, but um, 20 for the first, 19 for the second, and so on. Um, so this kind of then can help us rank um, the, yeah, future race outcomes, for example. And what we did is just trained uh, one model per race. So every race has its own model. Um, 
what we use also we did a bit of feature engineering there so we used we on one hand we used results from related races but also uh, overall performance in the past three years so the number of points to get the evolution in the past three years so that's kind of uh, we just look at the slope of how much they improved or not each rider um, form their best results in the race and also kind of their profile because each rider could ride can have different kind of profiles so to say um so what we had is an input of a list of 20 editions of races. So that's actually a quite small data set. And, uh, and what we wanted as an app is a ranking of rates. The problem is that it's not enough or not a lot of data to go through, especially for the kind of algorithms we wanted to use. So what we did and what we especially we noticed in this case, we used actually boost, but in reality, any type of uh, algorithm that has a learn to rank approach in them could be used. Uh, what we realized is that, um, again it's that we, there's not that, that much data so we were already thinking on how to get a squeeze the maximum out of the data that we have so one thing that we decided to do is actually uh, not have a validation uh, set but rather do cross validation so i think that's normal for for what that's until up until now that's something normal to do so we would take one year out of uh, we would basically take one year out of uh, each fold that we wanted to do, and then we would uh, yeah, check or tune the, the hyperparameters to that, and we would have, let's say, I don't know, this is seven, so we'd have would have seven, eight different models at the end, some different using one set of hyperparameters. Um, and then what we actually did is that we just used every single fold with those parameters to combine into one model. So do some kind of fold ensemble where we had some criteria with the minimum number of iterations that the, because we also had some early stopping uh, on our you know, algorithm and then also to validate them. It also it has to be number, uh, minimum, num minimum number of folds as well that we use. All in all, uh, if we look at the results, so we compare them, we compared the results uh, with with some fan predictions because I think that was a really good baseline. Can we do better than the fans? And how the fans prediction was is that there is this Pro Cycling Stats website where people can vote on who they think they will win the race and who will be in which place. And we kind of got the ranking from there and compared it to our ranking. And as we can see, it, uh, this is the number of correct uh, this is number of correct hits that we got on the top 10. Some races were really good. Some races were a bit not so good. And that, but then if you see the difference between our model and the fans model, we can see that on average, it's also not, um, it's not that, that different. So I think that it's also can say that we can be at least, uh, our ensemble can be comparable to an ensemble of fans, if you put it this way. What's the well? What's the impact of this, or how can we use this again? It's yeah, again, it could be input to coaches just for who to watch out for if they want to hire someone, or maybe yeah, and if, maybe we need to tweak it a little bit for scouting, but that's definitely a possibility. But also for fan engagement, we actually build a website out of this, and we had quite some interest and and also quite some questions about it. And I remember when it went down, people were messaging me, "Hey, when will this go back up?" Um, and maybe just show one cool thing, and, and I'm sorry that this is in Dutch, but and maybe but, but maybe one cool thing that I can show you, it's that uh, we could actually do different. We can actually do different predictions in time based on the results that we have. So as the results, as we get results from other races, we can then predict how the change in the position changes, which is also something quite cool. We got also quite some media attention um, from this here in Belgium, and also even compare even a one, yeah. We were trying to compete with one of the um, one of the specialized commenter commenters or you know, on TV on cycling, which we got two two, so no one won. Um, so that's that's for open data. But then there's also something called physiological sensors, and as long as we're talking about endurance sports, probably an important part of endurance sport is the cardiovascular system and how we measure it. Uh, and one way of measuring it, it is the heart rate. So I think that anyone that has done sports know that the faster we go, then the faster your heart works. But have you thought a little bit maybe of why this is important? And for this, I want to give you maybe a little um, yeah, a little introduction to, to 
exercise physiology just to tr get understanding of where does the energy come from. Now, I know there's probably might be some sports scientists here, and I know that I will be oversimplifying a lot of concepts, but this is just to get um, a little bit the intuition going uh, for the for the ones who are coming more from the data science field, of course. So basically, when we do sports, we have different energy systems. And um, yeah, the front line or the first, let's say, system is something called ATP-CP. Uh, and this is basically the energy that's directly available in the muscle. So this is if, uh, if you only do, for example, some kind of throws or something like that, you will only use this kind of energy and it's uh, it's that available so you can also do things instantaneously right so i can move my hands and so on um and this energy runs out of course quite quickly we're talking seconds but then we have another energy uh there's a process called glycolysis which basically transforms the glucose that you have available in your body and to produce also some energy um and this is why sometimes they say it's good to have some sugar before, uh, right before starting a run. And this is why also there's very fast carbs, which are basically glucose uh, in those energy gels. Um, and basically, yeah, then you use stats, and then at some point the glucose also runs out. And this depending how much glucose, of course, you have in your body. I don't want to go into details there, but basically it finishes at some point. Let's say let's say that it's minutes. And then this is where your uh, next one kicks in, your interoxidative system. So this is the most important one. So basically, when you don't have any more uh, energy available, either for ATP, CP, or glucose, then you'll need to get it somewhere else. And this typically <coughs> comes from an oxidative process, so meaning you use oxygen in combination, in this case, with fat to produce energy. So the higher and then the higher the density, then the more energy our body will require, and therefore more oxygen and more vascular system needs to work to get up that oxygen to us. Um, so as and this also how we can see how fit we are, right? So someone who is not fit will probably need more more oxygen to produce a certain amount of energy. But of course, and here again, oversimplifying things, but. To conclude a little bit, is it's that the heart rate, so and the changes in the heart rate while I do exercise, it can for certain situation efforts are very important actually. And when when we when we look at fitness, and they can really predict if you can do a certain um, a certain workout, or maybe that you will not be even able to finish it. You can already say before, and depending on your heart rate actually, um, and. This is one example that actually uses heart rate. So it's it's still, I think there's still a lot of things here that the, the authors of this work could have done better, but it gives an, a sense of an idea what also can LSTMs can, can be used for, uh, especially their real their nonlinear um their their nonlinear capabilities. So this is this is one example of work that is deep learning to basically predict the future heart rate under certain gradients. So uh and basically, it uses the heart rate, the cadence, and let's say in 10 minutes, I want to ride a 10, 10 let's say five degree slope. So what will be my heart rate there? Um, of course, they had mixed results, as you can see by these these two graphs. Some were quite well, some were quite some yeah, are really far off. Um, but if you think about what I told you before, this is actually really great because. This can already give you an indication. This would work perfectly, right? This could give you an indication of what you would be able to do, and if you would be able to make it to the top of a certain climb, or if you would hit some kind of plateau. Um, now, of course, in this in this work was limited to to only one participant, and it was it only it only considers heart rate and cadence. And if there are sports scientists again in this public, you would probably say that there's more things that you would need to account for, and especially. Uh, if we're talking about cycling, then power or power meter would be very important. But again, I just want to show the potential here. Huh? That we can see that if we if if uh, if we can predict how much a climb, if we basically can predict how much a climb can impact the heart rate, then we can also predict if we can do it at what speed we should do it, how fast we should do it. So this has also a lot of potentials there as well. So maybe I'll just show a couple of other examples um, where deep learning was used in some also other places that I've seen that I think might, might be interesting, but just go a bit rather a bit more quicker for them. So this is an example actually of a hackathon that was done uh, on an event that, that I recently organized, but where the team proposed to use the 
um, the the pose estimation to kind of see where the position of the of the hip and the knees are and then you could and then if you of course have enough data you can see what what is the ideal position for some place and then you can almost give immediate feedback to your uh, rower um another team in the same hackathon also also did an example on detecting where the players are in a in a paddle court and then measuring the distance between them and then recommending what is the ideal distance so there's a lot of these cool things that you can still do um, with deep learning and sports and especially a lot of different sports so i know i gave a lot of examples of football but you can actually there all these things are applicable to many many sports um this is another cool example that that i that i recently found is that also you can also use some kind of combination of uh, machine learning and game theory to kind of think about uh, what is the best way to take decisions on one versus one shots. Um, that's also very interesting and it will also connect a little bit to something I want to talk about in, in just a few minutes. So commercial solutions what's actually so i talked a little bit all, all this research has been done it's real good but what actually can you can you use so there's um different players in the market that do different things um uh, maybe i'll first show this so this is called optavision and basically um it's from a company called starts perform they do a lot of cool stuff but what they they do is already they take uh even they collect the the data they track the players and then they can already put all these things together. Um, so you get this kind of already cool, uh, rich information. And then based on that, and I'll skip it a little bit forward, based on this, uh, you can get, of course, a lot of different metrics, different, um, different types of uh, calculations. So for example, this is the line breaking and to see if, they, if they're doing it. So you can get really a lot of cool stuff just out of it. So uh, it's I think that they did a really great job, at least on, on their product from my perspective. Um, then there is also something more for amateurs as well. So this is called, this is an app called Paddle Court, um, where this is also quite interesting, where on one hand, uh, they can give you um, some advice, some more tactical advice, what you should do. And on, on when you replay, and on the other hand, they, they also, if you place your phone, they can also do automatic point counting, for example. So it's yeah, detected that the ball was out. Um, by the way, I haven't I haven't tried this out. I don't know how well it works, but I think it's really cool that it's already managed to get to an actual product level, and these algorithms are running somewhere as well. Yeah, another example is TrackMan. That's I think basically every professional pro golfer has one of these. It's they give you direct feedback on how you're hitting your ball, what's your angle of attack, what what how the ball will fly. And it kind of kind of is almost kind of a coach, right, for the for the um, for the player. And then now, this is not really commercial commercial, but this is somewhere where it's being put in practice as well. I just recently found it that also in the in the American football they're looking into using pose estimation to try to predict uh, where there might be injuries as well and what should they do so that they prevent those injuries themselves. Um, so that's just a couple of examples. There are plenty of more. I just tried to gather some so you have an idea that all these things that are done, it's not just, um, it's not just research, but there's actually a lot of people working on product, uh, productizing these things, and there's a lot of advanced things there as well. Um, so, but what actually the future could hold or what is there, like what are the benefits in all of this for sports? Well, I think one thing is, yeah, sports sustainability and growth. So of course, if you, if you go to any country, you will see that there's one sport that is popular, maybe two, three, but uh, then that's it. If in Portugal, I mean, it's football and then, yeah, there's some other things that some people follow, but basically it's football. Um, and sometimes, well, what, what this makes it a little bit harder for smaller sports because if there's no audience and there's less ticket, there's less possibility of sponsorship, of course. And then what you get is that you start kind of the big major sport just grows and grows and the other sports just kind of become less and less popular. Um, but then there's a really a possibility to do something which is personalized fan experience because right now we are, we're moving a thing from paradigm where we have TV broadcasting towards more streaming, more and people are just watching streaming. And what 
streaming allows us actually to think a, a little bit about but from the perspective of how could we make them the streaming personalized so let's say if i follow um one certain athlete maybe i won't maybe even if the athlete is not the best but i want to follow that athlete in a certain race maybe then i can have my own stream which is rather focuses the camera on that athlete and how fast or what what's he or she doing right so you can have these kind of more personalized or more engaging streams as well, because now we can do it actually, it's not just everyone watches the same image. Um, so actually we have, so ID Lab is kind of Ghent, you enter uh, an iMac, but, but my colleagues at the University of Ghent actually work a lot this perspective of um, how do we make fan engagement better? And they have several works done in that area. I'll just want to give two examples, which I find also really nice and great. So one of them is the fully automated camera for personalized highlights and generation in sporting events, where they basically use, um, where they basically, because all in this case in cycling, all the athletes will have some kind of sensors and these sensors always transmit the data and they also have an identifier for data. So what they did is then is something quite simple, but I still find quite cool. It's that, uh, as soon as he's wearing the sensor, there's a tripod which can detect that he's going to pass by. So you can annotate the video that the rider is passing by. And then if, for example, you have this multi-camera settings, you can always watch, for example, the same rider instead of watching what everyone is, is watching. Um, but then you can also do other cool stuff, which afterwards you can make a personalized uh, summary just for one certain person. You can look at the performance. Performance. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can done with you can do with this really easy setup. Um, another interesting I think thing that that I've seen recently. This was published by by, by a company. Just as a uh, the link is below if you, if you want to look at it. But just as a kind of a, a toy example, but it's actually quite easy to do. Is that if you have this event data, you in some kind of JSON or CSV or whatever for, format, you do some manual semantic labeling of the data where you say so you went from an event 10 bit where player a player z and then that's it but then if you actually translate it into words so at 241 player tackle players you receiving a red card and then you have this big list of just all the events but they're more semantically relevant um that you have it in one big text file if you feed it to a to LLM and then you probably can get some kind of summary and then you can start generating summaries and as you can imagine again if you have all this big list of events but then you want a summary of what a, just a certain player did during that game that's also possible so you start having this kind of personalization things that's really cool um maybe just one more example I don't know why this was a bit out of order it's supposed to be four but also um it's this was also done by my colleagues at the University of Ghent. And again, I think this is really cool. What they did was um, basically a system that could, based on video footage, identify uh, points of interest when you're filming it and then uh, bringing it up on the screen. And this is, everything is done automatically here. So it's based on some pictures that they have the point of interest and the location of the, of the helicopter. And then they could detect these images directly and then put it up there. So. Yeah, I think kudos also to them for, for this really cool, cool work. Um, but then we can also talk about, on, on another perspective, if we talk about team sports, you can also talk about an AI coach assistant kind of, right? So, and this is where I'm gonna start summarizing a little bit of everything I've said before. Um, so we talk about, right, on one hand, kind of these computer vision sensors algorithms where we could get the events, the position. So basically figuring out and helping this AI coach figuring out what's happening. Um, you have some other algorithms that I also talked about a little bit, which are the stat statistical learning, what's, what, what, what is the value of, of a certain action, what's happening, uh, the ghosting part as well. Um, and then there is also this kind of more recent work that has been popping up on how to use game theory and how to use generative AI to kind of think about strategy suggestion. And if you actually kind of put all these pieces together, you can actually get some kind of AI coach system that could just basically tell you what you should have done in certain situations. Or if you, for example, feed, feed, it, um, feed it a video with uh, a game, then it can just tell, okay, we're against this team, maybe you should focus on this, this, and this. This is what I know based on what you did. And I think that there's a lot of potential there, of course. It's a lot of resources, of course, to make all of this happen. Um, 
but you can also think about it for you can also use it for automatic biomechanical feedback as well this is a little bit more i think realistic that it's uh basically where you have the videos and you have the sensors uh, you can give them feedback on how a person should perform certain movements that they actually perform them. And actually, the, the cool thing here is that if you kind of take these things and then put it together with VR uh, and virtual reality, then uh, you can really help the person practice certain movements until it's actually there almost to, to perfections. And there's a lot of work done in that space as well. Um, but then we can also think about fitness coach assistant or some kind of personalized approach to cardiovascular training. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and here I, I wanted to uh, give you a little example of basically um, how this can be done, even maybe based already on some things that, that that's already done in sports, it's sports science as well. Huh? So if, for, so, for instance, I took this work, but there are many works like this. So this one looks at the correlation uh, between the heart rate variability. So it's just basically a physical phenomenon um, where the variation of the inter of of in time of in of of intervals between the heartbeats uh, it's measured, and then you can see what's your uh, heart rate variability. And then the virtual to threshold, which is another word here that might be a bit difficult, it's basically um, when um, is it's that when you switch to using uh, another kind of energy. We can put it this way, I'm oversimplifying it again. Uh, but how this kind of works in, in sports science look like, and I think that for the ones who work in computer science, they will see this is something new. For me, it was also something new as well. Eh? So you, you take a number of participants, in this case, 24 males, five females with some kind of mean age, body mass, body, body height, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you would do some kind of experiments. You would plot these graphs. And then you would say, OK, that there is some kind of correlation here. So we see that there is this correlation. But then the question is, of course, when you start making these kind of models or start making these kind of assumptions, you're still always generalizing it for these populations, which is those 24 males and those five females. But then you never look at the bigger thing. And I think one cool thing that could come out of this is that if you actually start thinking about n equals 1, and how can you rather take all this really cool work that's done by sports scientists and rather transform them into, into more personalized physiological models, right? Um, so basically, again, taking sensor data, taking, um, taking also maybe some annotated data for sleep or, or nutrition. And then if you can somehow put it into, into, into a model, which could give you predict of how well you might do or how much you might need to train, then that's also something I think a really cool f future I see, and that's possible as well with, of course, enough time and money invested in it. So <clears throat> talking about time and money, then what are the challenges and the risks? Um, <clears throat> well, one thing it's, it's been very much discussed, it's um, yeah, explainability. I think it's very important, especially if you're, the, the, this is just an example of, a, there's a comment, there was a comment on another paper uh, about, a, being able to have uh, explainable algorithms. and but, but where I wanted to go with this is actually, if you're going to talk with a coach or if you're going to talk with anyone who's outside of our field of data science, you will also need to try to explain, especially when there are surprising decisions of why this happened. Um, there's also privacy and regulations as well. So the, yeah, for example, the Professional Cricket Association, they recently created this Project Red Card, which is an initiative in the United Kingdom are spreading basically around uh, uh, the world where they, where they advocate that, that there could be more control over the data of the athletes as well. The thing that this is more and more also thought up in the contract. Another thing, it's there is this gap between data science and, 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 uh, and sports science. So there is this review paper, machine learning methods and sports injury. And actually um, what, what they found there, and, and they, they didn't look up Big, big, broad, they would look at broad papers published in PubMed. That's a resource for basically looking for biomedical and life science literature. Um, but basically, what what they what they saw is that uh, the quality of of the eleven studies that were there had a very low to moderate methodology quality, and that um, yeah, it, it, the authors were also a bit surprised that there were four papers that that mentioned, for example that tune the hyperparameters and the rest just used the default out of the box 
and sometimes what you could see is that they it's not even the correct measures for example are used um depending on what you want to do so it's it's a little bit yeah it's there there is i feel like that sometimes there is from the sports science side there is a they try to also apply these algorithms but then there's a lot of details and things that are there that the thing could still improve this is also why we created the Becoming Outstanding in Sport Analytics Winter School or Summer School, depending when it happens, because it happens every year and a half. If you're interested in this, uh, we're basically putting together um, data scientists and we're putting together sports scientists to kind of uh, learn a little bit from each other. And there's also Hackathon the end, which is really fun. If the next one is going to be probably in a year and a half, but if you're interested, ping me and I can add you to my mailing list. Um, <clears throat> and also, uh, yeah, there's also the problem with resources, the CAM. The gap is now will become bigger and bigger with sports and teams that have more money. An interesting thing that the UK Sport Sports Institute did uh, was actually they have a performance data team, which different sports could hire, and um, they did a couple of cool things. So, for example, the hockey team that developed a, a project with where they would look at, for example, which performance variables are more likely to lead to a goal during a penalty shootout. Um, they looked, uh, for example, at thresholds of of conversion. In, in shootouts, they looked at what are the best penalty takers so that, they, that they would use. Um, they also did the, the same kind of statistical modeling also for curling. So, but they kind of joined the resources into one rather than having them spread around different federations and different teams as well. So, and some that don't always have the resources for that. And this really allowed them to win some medals in the Olympics. But basically, yeah, this is maybe the last thing I will say, and I'm already a little bit over time as I see, but the more money you pour, basically the more money you get. And I think in, in sports analytics, and exercise, the same thing, it's the more money there is, um, then the more money you can, of course, invest. It's very costly in specialized human resources. You need uh, to understand what you're doing. You need um, servers. So yeah, it's, it's, it's quite intensive as well, but I think that's what can in the future make or break the difference. All right, I think I talked enough. I don't know if there are any questions or uh, anything that. Um, yeah, to I'm going to join you now. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat right now. Uh, yeah. But thank you, after all, for the excellent presentation. It was really insightful. Really, like, for me in my area, like, I really enjoyed the part where you were talking about, like, the, the biometrics or the bio stuff that you that you can measure but um let's 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 start answering some questions so sure. the, the first one uh was from anthony anthony he asked like uh, could this be used for to identify cheats like the the vision models um like for instance i hate how football players dive and think that a lot of other fans um hate it as this as well like for example uh, um, yeah, yeah. So I think I, I guess what what it means is that it's when uh, there is some kind of yeah. I don't know if the question is about faking it or 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 not. Um, but what I can what I can imagine is that yes. But also the the coaches right now. I'm sorry, the coaches. I'm already confusing the words. Uh, the referees also have right now some tools that they can actually rewatch some some of these things. But they, of course, they cannot be always used. But in theory, it should be possible, but it, I think it really depends on which situation and with mm, that we're talking about, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can imagine like, like uh, for example, now you have VAR, so you can check the, yeah. the, 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 the plays again and see for yourself, but it's always a human judge, like, so the... it, yeah, but 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 indeed, I mean, this is what I also think. Indeed, that there could be a possibility to have some kind of assistant, even even for the judge, right? Because you could have some kind of wearable that just alerts them. Hey, maybe you should look at the at the at the video because something might have went wrong, or somebody might have cheated. Yeah. So that that's a possibility because there is so many people on the field, but still, it's not possible. I think to see everything at all the time. Eh? Exactly. Exactly. <coughs> Um, we have another question, but I think uh, it was already answered. Like, what are the main problems of sports analytics? Uh, you, you talked about some of the yeah. big, biggest problems. Um, Luis asked um, more of a personal question. Like, you went abroad to study this topic. 
Uh, are there research chancers in Portugal studying this topic right now? No, no, not that I'm aware of. Um, that, that was also one of the reasons why I think I, I went there. But I think it is, it is a good possibility yeah, for Portugal. Um, even, even if we just focus in the beginning on football, I think there's a lot of possibilities of what we could do. And the federation is, by the way, I'm saying this, but the federation is also um, looking into, into how to do this and they do have analysts working for them. And they also, um, I think it was last year, they also organized through my other side, the Ripley, they also organized a, um, a hackathon or actually a datathon on how should we use football data and how can we get better insights. So there is something starting there, but I think we're lagging a little bit behind uh, yeah. other places. Yeah. I feel like Portugal is always a little yeah. bit late in everything, but we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Maurice, you asked like, so uh, how do you need to overcome data privacy issues and improve AI applications in sports limited by small data sets? Would synthetic data be an appropriate solution? Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. I think that there is a lot of possibility there for, for using synthetic data. I think it will depend a little bit on which use case. So. I'm not sure up until how much, for example, generating, I'm not, conv or let's put it this way. Uh, it's not that I'm not sure, but I'm not yet convinced that generating game data is that much possible since you really want to look at real life scenarios. But if you want to think about more about uh, heart rate data and things like that, maybe there, there is something that could be used. Yeah. Like but again, uh, I might be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is your insight. So yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, Luis asked again, like, um, do you know, uh, some concepts or tools developed inside of the area of sports that could be actually used outside of the, sp the scope? Good question. I think it's the other way that it usually happens, actually. It's exactly. That, yeah. <laughs> I think that, uh, sports borrows a lot of things that were developed. So let's, uh, when, when I talked, for example, about the the algorithm that we developed for detecting players. I mean, all of these things were developed outside of sports and then are applied to sports. Mm -hmm. um, if I think of anything right now, yeah, right now, to be honest, nothing comes to mind. I think it's really the other way that happens, but probably there is something. If I remember, I'll for sure write to you, Luis. Um, and Luis uh, said an, an last question. Um, where should a professional should, where someone should start if she wants to start using deep learning, uh, for sports professionally. So I assume that if someone wants to start, find a job using deep learning, is that, would that be the question? Because I'm not sure. Would uh, you say, I, I would assume that's the yeah. question. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that it, again, again, there's not. Like I said, it's also um, the, the biggest, one of the biggest problems in, in sports and in sports, of course, resources and funding. But there is there there, there are a couple of companies and football also, you know, football, um, football teams that hire data scientists, not always just to use deep learning, of course, but that do stuff. There's also a couple of consultancy companies um, that, for example, a top of my head, Zellos Consulting, but there's some other. I can what I what I can do is uh, maybe for the ones who are interested, just edit these slides and add one slide with some companies or some places. I know that um, you can look for for um, for sports um, jobs. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a. I was actually interested in this, but um, Francisco just posted this question in chat. Uh, is this being used in, to predict outcomes to win bets? Like, for example, the <laughs> betting and how unfair is it to <laughs> have like re real life data of what's happening in the game? For example, the football and not exactly yeah. the goals, but the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get this, I get this. So I think it's to, I think it's two questions. One, so one, one thing is, can we use these algorithms to have a betting algorithm, right? Well, it's you need to think that probably all, all the all the uh, how do you call them the the bet agencies? I don't know what's the name. The all the bookies they also have their own algorithms and they have money to build those algorithms. Yeah. Uh, so probably so you would need to basically be better than their algorithm in order to be able to 
consistently consistently make profit but i can say that and i know cases uh where people had some interesting probabilistic approach to make bets and they managed to make some money out of it as well um but then yeah but and then the second part it's using i think if you use if you have access to this data then it starts to become a little bit also insider trade it's kind of inside trading then i'm not sure how much of it of course is possible yeah I, I can imagine like people just automating some some kind of like better online that bet for yeah. me i give you money you give me the probabilities yeah yeah but but also i also want to say that the cool thing the cool the really cool thing about sports right it's that um it's that you really it's really unpredictable sometimes right you can be really surprised yeah. so i mean you can make all this prediction algorithms and even the one that, that i showed to you it's we we were similar to what the fan would predict so basically it's what on an average a fan would say this is the rider that will be in that or these are drivers will be in the top 10 and if i would bet in those i wouldn't be betting any better than an average fan of course yeah. mm -hmm. um so yeah and there were results where we would only get three Riders. This is also what we said when we look at algorithms: is that we cannot look at actually how much uh, riders we get correct, because it could have been just a very surprising result that was unexpected, mm -hmm. even according to any data points you might you might have, and you really need to compare it with uh, other fans or what other people would think, and then that would make it more fair to the algorithm as well. Like for example, in swimming, I think like I'm a swimmer, so my insights are in swimming part uh like i, I feel like uh, the betting is there's not not much betting but the the results are more or less like known beforehand unless yeah. like some magical happens in the swimming because swimming is really like a physical sports individual that only matters like there there's a little uh like outside the circumstances that can affect your your race for example yeah but but like uh, cycling for example like if there's a fall and more than one cyclist fall and then the result is completely unpredictable yeah yeah, yeah indeed there's there's so many things that that can happen yeah and of course but in swimming it's also a little bit more controlled environment right that yeah sense, exactly it's, it's not first you're not you're not swimming for six hours of course uh so that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. less things can right you reduce the the amount of time where something could happen it's also more in a more controlled environment um and then it's yeah it's as you say then of course you know more or less uh how the results looked like in the previous competition so i can imagine that the world the world championships can be a predictor for the olympics right exactly like like the world championship is like everyone is in the best shape ever so probably yeah. it's going to be the same result in the yeah. in the the olympics yeah um, Luis is striking with the questions and it's going to be the last question, but, uh, it's more about like, what about swimming? Like, is there something that like people are working right now? Like, yeah, there is, there is, there's a couple of I think cool things that are also done. Um, I, I came across recently, I think last year, end of last year, mid last year, I came across, um, uh, an article, I think, what they were trying to do, for example, is automatic swimming activity recognition. Mm -hmm. So, um, if I remember correctly, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head the paper, but of course, it's <laughs> it's a little bit already. Yeah, been, yeah, it's been already a little bit before. But uh, basically, I think that they were trying to 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 identify uh, the, the the yeah the different um, strokes. Swimming, yeah, the swift, the stif yeah, the different swimming techniques. But then also what they what they were trying to do also is checking the the lap time and all of this based on a deep learning approach as well. So yeah. there is some things that you can do, and I think especially in swimming, I think the most where I see personally in swimming, and because I also did a little bit of triathlon training, I did not do a triathlon, but I started training for one because I abandoned <laughs> it. And what what I noticed myself personally also for swimming is running, cycling. It's you don't need that much technique, right? But swimming, it's very, it's very technique intense sport. And and if you can yeah. master the technique, you can make the swimming 
much more effortless than yeah, if yeah. you don't know the exactly. proper technique. So there, where I see the potential, and because right now it's you really need, I think, a human to give you feedback of what you're doing because you cannot see yourself. So if you could have, yeah, first you would need probably some kind of cameras, of course, underwater, yeah. and then another thing you would need to, if you would have those cameras, then you could um, do some things. I think that there was also one cool work done um, Maybe by Ghent, I'm not sure, but that where they have at the swimming pool here in, in Antwerp, they have cameras under the swimming pool, but that they're stationary cameras. And mm -hmm. what they did is that they put together, they stitched together the video so that you can see the swimmer actually swimming in, in a lane, so they kind of follows them, but the cameras are fixed. Um, yeah. And that's really cool uh, because after that, you can do stroke analysis, of course, just from the video. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, I, I lived in Amsterdam, and they they had the same system in the pool there and i feel like like there, there's a lot of possibilities there because it, you, we just need money like <laughs> that's the basically, basically, yeah, yeah, that's, basically that's the biggest problem yeah like right now the the portuguese federation has like a guy analyzing the videos and all the strokes and all the stroke rates and the technique but um maybe you could use some help of some algorithms yeah. it, it could be yeah, better it's yeah but this is yeah i think but if, if we talk about portugal and i think where it, i think differently we can learn from the uk yeah? we have the, what i think they did really great is that in their sports institute they created this data team i mentioned and they then they just concentrate all the knowledge and know-how in one place and then they work on projects depending on what is needed from different federations or from different coaches and it yeah it helps already a lot i think yeah, yeah um okay so i think i'm gonna wrap it up um so all this this the the video will stay on the youtube channel of the deep learning sessions portugal and the slides will be on our github page um uh, i will ask you so you could uh, fill the form for the feedback so we can improve the next sessions uh it will be on the video description and I want to thank everyone for joining us today and Leonid especially because of the excellent presentation and the best insights that we could ask for. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Leonid. Yeah. And thank, thank you so much also for having me.